All right, we are approaching time to get started tonight. Invite in and take your seats. There's still some good seats down front. If anybody feels compelled to move down some, I know you won't listen if I ask you to, so it'll have to be of your own volition. <laughs> I begged and pleaded yesterday, and you know, y'all just don't listen very well. I don't know what that says about you, but we are delighted to have you back here. A good crowd again tonight. We've had a wonderful day today, a wonderful evening last night, and we're looking forward to our time together tonight. We're going to begin with uh, singing as we did last night and looking forward to uh, these men leading us in the singing. One of the unique things that we're getting to introduce this week is the worshiping with the Psalms Psalter uh, that is brand new, I think on the screen above me right now. Uh, and we're literally getting to sing from the Psalms because of the work that uh, Brother Matt Basford has done over the years to paraphrase the Psalms. Uh, put them in rhyme and meter in a way that they can be sung with familiar tunes. And so uh, just as we did last night, uh, these gentlemen tonight are going to lead us in a couple of those psalms out of the book. Uh, remember that in the book itself, it just looks like poetry on the page. Uh, but uh, tonight, for uh, ease of use for us, we have put it uh, with the shape notes. Uh, not necessary to sing it with the shape notes, but we wanted to be sure that uh, crowds seeing it for the first time could uh, easily sing along and, and give us a good feel for what it's like uh, to sing through these uh, wonderful psalms. So we're looking forward to that to that tonight. Um, on the stage with me tonight is Tony Sexton uh, from the from Pepper Road and uh, also uh, Thomas Peake from Oakland. And they're going to be leading our singing, uh, and then following that, we'll have our speaker uh, introduced tonight. first psalm that we will sing will be Psalm 22a, and this will be to the tune of Lamb of God. And oh, my God, my God, I groan to you, so why have you forsaken me? By night I pray, do you do not hear? By night but suffer woefully. Yet you are throned upon our praise. Our fathers put their trust in you. This is also from Psalm 22, Psalm 22b. We'll sing this song to the tune of Tis Midnight and on Olive's Brow. As you can probably tell, there are some holes in the building tonight. And being spread out like this, it, we have a tendency to lose track of each other. So if you will just follow the leader as we're beating time, 
we can all stay together that way. two songs will focus on the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll sing 221 in Gethsemane alone. Damn. 
Terry here, he told the three. Terry here and watch for me. But they heard no bitter moan. For the three disciples slept while my loving Savior wept. In Gethsemane alone. Oh, what love, matchless love. Oh, what love for me was shown. His forever I will be for the love he gave to me. When he suffered all alone, long in anguish deep was he, weeping there for you and me. For our sin to him was shown, we should love him evermore for the anguish that he bore in Gethsemane alone. Oh, what love, matchless love. Oh, what love for me was shown. Next song will be number 238, 10,000 Angels. We will sing the chorus after the second and last verse. for mercy. 
mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished. He gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. sing, He Carried My Sorrows, all four verses. He carried my sorrows, he bore my grief, was pierced for transgression, afflicted for peace. He knew by his stripe I am healed through his blood. I can kneel for by his oppression. I worship my King. He suffered in anguish. He writhed in pain, was smitten, forsaken, abandoned and slain. He knew by his stripe I am healed. Through his blood I can kneel, for by his oppression I worship my King. Despised and rejected, he knew no sin, was pressed for his people. Within. He knew by his stripe I am healed through his blood I can deal for by his oppression I worship my king my heart mourns his chastening my tears still fall. My sin was the reason he gave me his all. He knew by his stripe I am healed. Through his blood I can heal, for by his oppression I my King. Let's sing Exalted, number 198. Seen with blinded 
worshiped with content. Prone upon a crawl, exalted, scorned by those who Survey the wondrous cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of next song will be I Stand Amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me. Condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For 
and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone how marvelous how wonderful am I song triumphal entrance. This may be a new song to some of you, so those who do know it, sing out. Um, it's not a difficult song, but it is a great song. The first verse speaks about the triumphal entrance into Jerusalem of Jesus, and they called him the Messiah, but he wore no robe or crown. But the multitudes bowed down. The second verse says the Messiah claimed his robe and crown there when he conquered death at Calvary. The third verse said our, king's return, our king returns and the trump resounds and that we will claim our robe and crown. Great song. Triumphal entrance. Hosanna, King, the crowd resound, their branches pave the dusty ground. Messiah wears no robe or crown, yet all oh, the multitudes bow down. This prophet king from Galilee is on the road to Calvary. Our Lord, the King, the host resounds, their branches sweep the golden ground. Messiah claims his robe and crown. Angelic multitudes bow down. The risen lamb in victory. 
glory hath conquered death at Calvary. Our King returns, the trump resound, and angel voices shake the ground. The saints receive their robes and crown as at the throne of men bow down. The Son of God triumphantly will lead us home through Calvary. This is our theme hymn, you might say, for the week. I believe in Jesus. Do, so, do, he, do. I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he still storm Galilee. I believe that he walked on the water. And I believe that he's the answer for me. Yes, I believe. I believe he died on Mount Calvary, and I believe that the tomb was found in he, and I believe that he's the answer for me. I believe in the words of the Bible, how he made the poor blind man to see. I believe that the deaf ears were all past, and I believe He's made a difference in me. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the truth That is the answer for me. I believe that he spoke to Lazarus, and he said, Unbind and set free. And I believe that he is coming again. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I tomb was found empty, and I believe that is the answer for me.
isn't it wonderful that our God made worship something that we participate in rather than simply observe as spectators? And that as a part of worship, we can sing and admonish one another, praise God, and glorify his Son. And that's the theme of the lecture this, that of the series this week. And as we talked last night about reasons for faith in Jesus, tonight we turn our attention to the subject, I believe, that Jesus died for my sins. Brother Shane Carrington is going to speak to us on this vital biblical theme. Uh, Shane is from Sulphur Springs, Texas, has been there for 24 years, uh, has labored for the last nine years as one of the uh, elders in addition to serving as an evangelist. I've known Shane since the 1980s. I moved to his hometown of, of Cooper, Texas, and he was down the road at that time at a little place called Dyke. And then afterwards moved to a place in East Texas called Jasper, and maybe there was some other stop along the way, but has been at Sulphur Springs in the most recent quarter century. Uh, Shane is a, one of my dear friends. I've known him since we were young, or younger, I guess I should say. And he was, came from a good family. His mother was a member of the Cooper Church. His uncle was also a member there. Uh, Cooper's sort of an interesting little place. It, it was one of the places J.D. Tant uh, was known to have preached and had some rather unique experiences. I can tell you about it some other time. Uh, Brother Bill Cavender preached there, Brother W.R. Jones. Cooper also has given rise to two preachers, Joe Price and Shane Carrington. And so that little bitty town, the whole county is 5,000 people. The town is 1,000. But from that little town of Cooper, Texas, uh, two gospel preachers who presently serve the Lord and the cause of Christ have come. Uh, Shane is a faithful husband, his, his wife Kelly, uh, devoted servant of the Lord that, that serves by his side. He has a godly family, his children and grandchildren are listed in the book as well. But I would say if we describe Brother Carrington, he is a devoted husband and father, preacher and pastor in the biblical sense, and friend. And so give your attention, please, uh, to Brother Shane Carrington. There is no way, someone says, that I would ever send my son to the cross. I love him too much. There's no way that I could put him through that. And in fact, people are the ones who make such a disaster out of their lives. They need to deal with their own problems. I would not make such a sacrifice as that. Thus begins in the minds of some criticism of the love of God for his son and for the world and his grace to make for us a salvation that, yes, we do not deserve. God he was to pay that cost, father and son, to give us a means of redemption. I'm privileged for the last number of months to be able to study what I'm going to present to you tonight. And it has deepened my faith. It has strengthened me as a servant of God. I think it's made me more attentive as a gospel preacher and teacher. And I think it's made me a better man to think about our Lord and what he went through. And as I was assigned, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I'm thankful to talk about exactly what I was assigned because what a privilege it is to focus on our Lord and what he did for all humanity. Now, as we think about those things tonight, so many wonderful passages come to mind. Many will come to your minds that we will not address in any detail. Certainly Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant of God. We see the sacrifice of Jesus in prophecy given some 700 years before he ever came. And what we're going to talk about tonight as we address these things is we will look at some biblical evidence. We will look at extra biblical evidence. And then we will especially focus on the question of why 
Why did it take the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross and dying for our sins? Well, before we get into the lesson, I want to thank you for this opportunity. What a privilege I consider it to be able to talk about Jesus who died for us and hopefully in some small way help us in our walk with God and in our ability to turn to a skeptical world and try to win them to Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. And it is true, some look at what God did. He sent His Son. Some look at what God made available, the grace for all humanity. And they begin to criticize. They don't understand, why did God do that? Why did he do it in that way? And while we may not be able to fully understand all the reasons that God has, we certainly are given many indications as to why we needed exactly that to happen. And that Christ on the cross was not a waste of a life. Christ on the cross was the magnificent grace of God. It was God reaching out to a lost world in the only way that the lost world could be redeemed. If Jesus had not done that, there would be no hope. And in the wisdom and power of God, he declares to us those things that were done. You know, crucifixion was performed over a period of about a thousand years, from about the 500s B.C. until the 300s A.D. And through all of those years of time, there were literally thousands of people who were crucified. Not only that, in that particular part of the world, it was done in a variety of different ways. I know sometimes people want to get caught up on, well, it was the T-shaped cross. Well, it was the Latin-shaped cross. Well, it was an X-shaped cross. Well, it wasn't a cross at all. It was just a, a torture stake, whatever people want to say about that. Let me tell you something, folks. When we get so distracted on the exact method that we miss the power of the crucifixion of Jesus, when we miss the importance of his propitiation as he gave himself for our sins, if we're distracted by those things so that we miss what it was all about, then we've missed what it was all about. As we consider what Jesus did, arguing about the method distracts, but his crucifixion is vividly portrayed in Scripture. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we're not going to read from... Isaiah 53 tonight, but 1 Peter chapter 2 certainly quotes Isaiah 53 and alludes to Isaiah 53. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to begin our reading with verse 21, where here it says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. I want you to notice Imitating Jesus is one of the reasons he went to the cross. He wants us not to live as a selfish people in this world considering only what is in our own personal interest, but rather we're to look with a sacrificial nature like God the Father, like God the Son, like God the Spirit, that we might be a giving people, imitating our giving God, and that we might be sacrificial for the benefit of others as they have been sacrificial for our benefit. Verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. And I want you to notice a turn that takes place in verse 25. We've been looking at Jesus as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. But now verse 25 says, For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. My friends, the Lamb of God to redeem us is also the shepherd God who leads us. And 
And one of the ways in which he leads us is he takes us in selfless giving to be willing to give for others as he gave for us when he went to the cross to redeem us. Chapter 1 of 1 Peter, beginning with verse 18, he says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. As we think about this historical event of Jesus the Christ giving himself on the cross. Consider a few things with me for a few moments. You know, the historicity of the crucifixion of Jesus is sometimes criticized and set aside by some. Brother Nathan Moore did a wonderful job in talking about that this morning. And if you will look in, in the, the lecture book, and uh, perhaps Brother King will address this more fully on Thursday night, but he talks about some of the different false theories that there are, the hallucination theory, myth, conspiracy, swoon theory. These are all attempts to set aside either the crucifixion or the resurrection or the combination of the two. But none of these will hold water. The idea that, uh, that many people had a hallucination of the exact same thing, that's not really much of a theory. The myth theory, they just made it up. Conspiracy theory, they made it up. <laughs> the swoon theory, he didn't really die. When the record of scripture talks about the lance going into his side and the blood and water issuing forth. And to think that Roman soldiers didn't have a clue how to execute someone, those will not hold water. And again, those other resources will give you more details about that. But there are extra-biblical evidences for the crucifixion of our Lord. Consider a couple of quotations. John A. Dennis in the IVP Dictionary says that Jesus was executed under Pontius Pilate is a firm fact of history. Joel B. Green in his writing on this says, The crucifixion of Jesus under Pontius Pilate is among the most historically certain events of Jesus' life. Many historians acknowledge the crucifixion of Jesus and that the descriptions of the crucifixion of Jesus as we read about them in the New Testament are consistent with other accounts of crucifixions that we have in history that are left to us. But not only that, consider a couple of quotations one of those is from uh, an antagonistic witness, which, by the way, are the best ones. If you have a witness who doesn't believe what you believe, but he says what you believe, then that's pretty strong. And one of those that we see is Tacitus. And Tacitus lived in the first century. And he says this, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, that would be crucifixion, by the way, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of procurator Pontius Pilate. There is a non-Christian. There is someone who is not sympathetic to being a follower of Jesus, yet he acknowledges about the crucifixion of Jesus at the hands of Pilate. And there are many others, but one that is perhaps very telling is by Josephus himself. But I want to do a couple of things with this Josephus quote that we have. I want you to notice there are some brackets around some of the words. Let's read it as it is sometimes portrayed, and then we'll talk about that. Now, there was about this time, and again, Josephus lived in the first century. He was born not long after Jesus died, in fact, just a few years. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as receive the truth with pleasure, 
He drew over to Him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, that is the Jewish leaders, had condemned Him to the cross, those that loved Him at the first did not forsake Him, for He appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning Him. And the tribe of Christians so named from Him are not extinct at this day. Okay, what about the brackets? Well, I do not have the expertise. There may be some in this room who do to be able to judge whether or not what's in the brackets are authentic or not authentic. But just for the sake of argument, let's drop the brackets out. And let's notice what we're still left with. This is the undisputed part of this section from Josephus. Jesus was a wise man, a doer of wonderful works, a teacher. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, again, the Jewish leaders, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Even the disputed parts, if removed, still give us exactly what we're looking for in this lecture tonight. And that is non-biblical evidence, extra-biblical evidence that is, of the crucifixion of Jesus at the hands of Pontius Pilate in the first century because the Jews called for his blood. The crucifixion of Jesus, again, as John Dennis says, is a fact of history. But as we consider the death of our Lord, I want us to think for just a few moments about the horror of the crucifixion of Jesus. And I know... Not everyone may agree with the Journal of the American Medical Association 1988's article in this respect or in that, but let me say two things about that. Number one, if only 40% of what this article says is true, the horror of crucifixion is unimaginable. Number two, if there are small details here or there that in the course of time we discover may not be exactly right, we're still going to be pretty close with the descriptions that are given in that article. You know, when they took Jesus and they were going to kill him, they first put him on trial. And when Pilate couldn't make any headway, he decided one of the things that he would do is he would take him off in some private setting and he would have him mocked. And he would have him scourged. And he took off his clothes. And they put a purple robe on him. They put a staff in his hand, mocking a kingly scepter. They made a crown of thorns. Not the small thorns of the rose. But more like the lotus thorns that we in the south are quite familiar with. They wove a crown of thorns and they pressed that into his brow. And then they not only did that, they smote him on top of the head while that crown of thorns was on his head. Now, if you know much about the human anatomy, you know that when the scalp area is pierced, it bleeds incredibly freely. My friends, when they put that crown of thorns on the head of Jesus and drove the thorns into his scalp, he would have literally been covered in blood. They mocked him as if he were a king, and then they, they took him out to the place of crucifixion and, or out to the place of scourging, and they did what they did always in scourgings. They removed all of his clothes. They tied him to a post. And they took a whip more akin, and again, we in the South are familiar with these, more akin to the bull whip, where you have a handle and you have leather thongs and they're woven together to a certain degree. At the end, they are separated. Yet in the scourging whip, they would tie 
small pieces of bone, broken bone, maybe small lead balls. And then either with one Roman soldier on either side or only a single Roman soldier alternating sides. And with the whip, they would strike him on the far side of his back. And the tearing motion of that would go from the outside in and down. And unlike the Jews who would say 39 stripes, stay short of 40, Romans didn't care about that. And they beat him mercilessly. Uh, history tells us that there were even uh, some people who died from scourging. Never made it to crucifixion. That the scourging was so severe that it killed him. In the case of Jesus, perhaps his scourging was especially severe. Because here is a young man. No doubt a strong man. A carpenter's son. And he couldn't even carry the cross beam out to the place of crucifixion. Perhaps that indicates severe and thus his body was very weakened by that but they didn't just scourge him they took him out to Golgotha and they threw him on the ground the cross beam apparently they fastened him to it in that fashion while the upright post apparently stayed in place all the time and they drove nails into his hands. Now, when we think about nails, we think about something a little different than this. You can see on the, on the picture, the drawing, these are more akin to railroad spikes. Five to seven inches long, three-eighths at the head, perhaps. These are large. And they drove the, the spikes into the area, right in the wrist area, where it wouldn't tear out. You put it up here, it will tear out. It won't tear out down here. And I was talking to a chiropractor friend about, uh, about this one time, and he, he said, he said, Shane, here's something that you might want to think about. He said, you know carpal tunnel syndrome? And how that people who have carpal tunnel syndrome, they get the claw-like grasp, and, and there's excruciating pain in their hands. He said, the reason they have so much pain is because there's a large nerve that goes into this area. And the restriction there causes the pain in the hands. He said, think about this. With that spike, it's not just putting some pressure on that nerve. It would crush, perhaps sever. Can you imagine the fiery bolts of pain that would come from that? And they put it in one, they put it in the other, and then they hoist him up, and they put the cross beam in place, and then there's a little stool where they could rest, and then the feet are overlapped and another spike there. And just like there's a large nerve going through the arm into the area of the hand, there's a large nerve going down the leg into the area of the foot, and in both feet, crushed or severed. But it gets worse. Because hanging on a cross, generally the way that people died is that they suffocated. The area of the chest and of the diaphragm are in such a condition or such a position when like this that you can take a breath of air in, but you can't expel it. So to expel the breath of air, what you have to do is you have to pull with your arms and push with your feet and come off of the stool that was there to rest on to make you last longer so you would die more slowly. Pull and push and expel the old breath and retrieve anew and come back down and rest on the little stool until you had to have another breath. Every time, every time Jesus took a breath of air, his arms his hand there was working on those spikes. His feet were pushing on those spikes for every breath of air. Generally, it seems that the reason people died from crucifixion is that they asphyxiated. They finally got to the point to where they couldn't pull themselves, they couldn't push themselves, and so they just hung there and suffocated on a breath of air that they could not expel. 
And this seems biblically verified too because if you'll recall, when it came time to take the criminals down from the cross, one on the left, one on the right, Jesus in the middle, what did they do? They started breaking legs. Why did they break the legs of the one on the left and on the right? Because if your legs are broken, how many pull-ups can you do? With the legs broken, you can't push. And so suffocation would result. Jesus had already yielded up his spirit. And thus they did not break his legs, but inserted the lance. And the blood and water, as we mentioned earlier, came forth. My friends, crucifixion was designed to do several awful things. It was designed for incredible, physical, tortuous agony. In fact, our English word for excruciating comes from the Latin phrase of the cross. But it was also designed as, as a way to embarrass, to shame the one who hung there upon the cross. And we think about the pain that Jesus went through, but, but in reality, the shame of the cross was one of the primary reasons that they did it. He was put on display as if he were among the worst of criminals, as if he's being completely rejected by society. And the scripture that we're familiar with, that we sang tonight, I am a worm and not a man. Crucifixion was designed to dehumanize the one who was hung there. Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Both Deuteronomy and Galatians mention that, and in Galatians specifically about the crucifixion of Jesus. My friends, that historically is what crucifixion was. And our Lord was not spared any of the horror that belonged to that. And the reason he did that is because we were sinners who needed him to take away our transgressions. But I want to talk with you briefly now with the remainder of our time about what the crucifixion first declares and second, what the crucifixion shows. So what does the crucifixion declare? My friends, the crucifixion declares the vast fulfillment of prophecies. Brother Humphreys talked about Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 this morning where we see that in this battle between Satan and Christ, we see that Satan would bruise him on the heel, but he would bruise Satan on the head. Now, I don't really want my heel bruised, but I sure don't want my head to be damaged. And how could it be that, that Jesus... That his death on the cross is described as a heel bruise as compared to what he did to Satan. I'll tell you why. Because in fulfilling that prophecy, he crushed the head of the serpent through his death. But Jesus also arose. Whereas the damage he did to Satan has eternal implications. We see our forgiveness prophesied in Isaiah 53 that we alluded to before, but also our ultimate resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, and read with me, if you will, from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. 1 Corinthians 15 declares to us that in his death and in his resurrection, he was fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures and thus the vast fulfillment of prophecies. But in Romans chapter 8, come down to verse 29 with me. And here we see, for those whom he foreknew, here we see the plan of God in his mind before uh, so many things took place. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And thus, in a very general way, and from a 30,000 foot aerial view, we see a description of what God did for humanity to take us who were separate from God and make us like his son 
so that we can have forgiveness and hope now with eternal implications yet to come of glorification with him throughout all eternity. And thus we see the vast fulfillment of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his crucifixion to make our eternal hope possible. But secondly, notice with me, that the crucifixion also declares to us the glorious hope of the resurrection. You know, Romans chapter 4 this time, we're going to be in Romans quite a bit for a little while now. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, it says concerning Jesus, he was delivered over because of our transgressions and he was raised because of our justification. And so here we see that when you look at the death of Jesus on the cross, it speaks to the idea that he will arise. Think about it. If Jesus died and that was it, what would, what would be of our hope? But if Jesus dies as the sacrifice to deal with our sins and then arises from the grave to provide ultimate victory, then those two things in combination do for us what only Jesus could do. Recall in John chapter 11 and verse 25, Jesus proclaimed himself to be the resurrection and the life and that in believing in him, we shall never die. And what does he mean by that? I am the resurrection and the life. Folks, he can't be the resurrection unless he first goes to the grave. From the cross to the grave to the resurrection. And thus, his death anticipated his resurrection. And when you talk about Christ on the cross, we need to keep in mind what the disciples couldn't seem to hear. You remember when Jesus told the apostles, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer at the hands of the Jewish leaders. And I'm going to die. And they seem to have closed their ears because the next thing he says was, and then on the third day, I'm going to rise. But all they heard was about him dying. His death, though, speaks to the glorious hope of the resurrection. Notice also with us tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 this time, is that the crucifixion declares the futility of human philosophy. You know, we began our lesson tonight talking about a hypothetical situation, which actually you've probably heard somebody say before. I couldn't send my child to the cross. I love my child too much. Which is really an indictment of what God did when he sent his son. That my love is greater than God's because God sent his son to the cross. And I couldn't do that. Well, it's a misunderstanding of a lot of things. But the crucifixion of Jesus shows that human philosophy is futile by comparison. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now digress with me here for just a moment. What does Paul mean by that statement? I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Does that mean that Paul didn't talk about baptism? He talked about it in chapter 1. He talked about it in chapter 12. Okay, does it mean he didn't talk about the church? He talked about it all the way through 1 Corinthians. Okay, does it mean he didn't talk about the standard of morality? No, 1 Corinthians has vast stretches which talks about morality. Does it mean he didn't talk about marriage and divorce and remarriage? No, he talked about that a little bit at least in chapter 7. So what does he mean by that when he said, Now, I determined among you not to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Folks, here's what he meant by that. Everything I teach, everything I say, the gospel that I preach with its standard of morality, with its manner in which we worship, and everything else about the will of God, it centers on what? Jesus, who died on a cross to redeem us from our sins. It all goes back to that. You can't preach the gospel in truth unless the crucified Lord is front and center 
when we talk about baptism, when we talk about morality, when we talk about the church, when we talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, when we talk about anything that, that we teach from Scripture, it all has to go back to what does our Lord who died for us want us to know and do relative to all of those subjects and many more? We exalt Jesus crucified when we teach whatever Scripture teaches for us to declare. We exalt the crucified Christ when we teach the whole counsel of God. But we demean the crucified Christ if we think some Bible subjects we're just too sophisticated to discuss. The futility of human philosophy, the crucifixion of Jesus shows that to be exactly that. You know, also this morning, Brother Humphreys mentioned Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Let me say just a thing about that before I move on to this next part. And that is, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and, and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Jesus, a real man, a true man, came. He was God incarnate. God in the flesh means God came as man. But Brother Elmer Moore used to say Jesus was God as God is and man as man ought to be. And amen to that. Brother Humphreys also brought out 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 where we see that, that God was manifested in the flesh. So Jesus was a real man, yes, but Jesus never gave up his divinity. He was both God and man simultaneously. And let me say, get out the telescope, get out the microscope, whatever you do in relationship to that, just remember this, that is way over our heads. Thank God he was both, serve him because he was both. And let's don't diminish either aspect of who Jesus was. To diminish his humanity is to diminish his crucifixion. To diminish his deity is to diminish his crucifixion. And again, as Brother Humphreys brought out this morning so well, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, who went to the cross? Who gave his blood? It is the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. God died on the cross. And the only way God can die is if God comes as man. And human philosophy doesn't understand that. And I frankly tell you, I do not fully understand that. But I'm not about to deny it. And I thank God for it. Because when God went to the cross as one of us, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. It took a man to die on the cross, not just some animal. It took a sinless man to die on the cross, not just any human being. But folks, there are a lot of sinless human beings in this world. There are innocent little children. There are others who have no sin because they never violated the holy will of God. Yet it took more than that. It took a divine person. The only way a divine person could do what Jesus did is if God came as man. Human philosophy wrestles with that, but accept it as the testimony of Scripture and honor Jesus with all that we do. The crucifixion also declares God as both just and the justifier. Turn to Romans chapter 3 with me, if you will. Romans chapter 3. Beginning with verse 21, Romans 3, beginning with verse 21, but now apart from the law, that is the law of Moses' system, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manif manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, the righteousness of God here is, is not a discussion of how that God is personally righteous, though I will tell you very clearly that he is. The righteousness of God here is the fact that God is faithful to his promises, the promises and prophecies he made throughout history. 
He is faithful to those. And in his faithfulness for that, he provided a way for lost human beings to become righteous. <coughs> to be forgiven of our sins. And to have hope. Let's keep reading. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus... For all those who believe, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by His grace through redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. We're going to spend some time talking about that here in just a moment. As a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate... His righteousness, that is, His means of making us righteous through His faithfulness to keep His promises that He made throughout history. We looked at some of those prophecies earlier, actually. And thus, because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed, for the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now allow me just a brief aside. He keeps talking about the righteousness of God. In Calvinistic and Neo-Calvinistic concepts, the idea of the righteousness of God is that you're a sinner and God can't accept you, but what Jesus did is Jesus came and he died to be your replacement. And so when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. What he sees is the umbrella of Jesus overlaid. So here you are, you're the sinner, and God has overlaid the righteousness of Jesus on you. And so his righteousness is transferred to you. It overlays you, and God doesn't see you. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's what Calvinism teaches. It's what Neo-Calvinism teaches. It's not what God teaches. What God teaches is we are lost because we are sinners. And what did Jesus do? He died so His blood can do what? Wash us clean. We are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. His sacrifice is not a cover-up job for what I am. His sacrifice is to remove the sins that separate me from God and I can be right with God again. What does this passage teach us? God is two things. He is just. He is holy. And He cannot accept sin. And God can't accept us as lost sinners. Now that's some pretty bad news. Except there's the other part of it. And that is God is the justifier. And the only way the holy God, who cannot just overlook sin, he can't just sweep it under the carpet, he can't hide it under an umbrella, he can't act like we haven't done it. So what he did is he sent his son, and his son cleanses us. So God sees you. He sees you forgiven. And my friends, that's the grace of God. This cover-up job idea of the personal righteousness of Christ being infused to you so God doesn't see you, he only sees Jesus. That's not forgiveness. That's not true holiness. That's me still being as sorry as I was before and in need of transformation. Jesus took away our sins by being the sacrifice sufficient, which takes us to our word propitiation. In verse 25, whom God displayed publicly, Jesus was publicly crucified to acknowledge everybody's need and God's willingness to sacrifice to redeem us. The word propitiation is an interesting word uh, from Mounts' dictionary. He says atonement is uh, generally translated as to atone, wipe clean, appease. He says while scholars debate whether the root meaning of this verb is cover, ransom, wipe clean, purge. There's a lot of theology going on there from various points of view. 
uh, you can see. But notice the last thing he says. It is the last one that seems most appropriate in the Old Testament, and that is to purge, to wipe clean, to take away sins. Uh, I'm looking in my Bible now, Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. By the way, if you want to know what, what uh, atoning sacrifices were, Leviticus is a great place to see the definition of it over and over and over again. One of those is Leviticus chapter 16 and in verse 30 where he talks about the day of atonement and he says, For it is on this day that atonement or propitiation that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. That's what atonement means. That's what propitiation means. And Christ on the cross, his crucifixion declares that God maintains his justice while still justifying us because God made the ultimate sacrifice to redeem us from our sins, to cleanse us from our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is an interesting passage and it's, it's given some interesting uh, treatment from time to time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. And here Paul writes, let's actually start with verse 20. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. They're the apostles in their work. Uh, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Okay, now what did God do so we can be reconciled to him? He, God the Father, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, in, in Calvinistic concepts, Jesus became sinful. It, there's a triple imputation in Calvinistic thought. You have the sin of Adam transferred to the newborn baby. But then you have the sin of humans transferred to Jesus on the cross. And then you have the perfect righteousness of Jesus transferred to the believer. Triple, impu triple imputation. And this verse is sometimes used under that end. But I want you to notice what the passage doesn't say. First of all, it doesn't say he made him who knew no sin to be sinful on our behalf it doesn't say that in fact if you look at the idea of how this is used uh, first of all Jesus did not become sinful we read first Peter chapter 1 18 through 19 earlier where where we see that Jesus shed precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless Jesus did not become sinful when he died for our sins Jesus had to be pure and sinless or he couldn't have taken away our sins in his death upon the cross. It was the pure son of God who went to the cross. So with that in mind, what is 2 Corinthians 5.21 trying to say? Well, New American Standard 2020 version, the NIV and the NRSV all have in their footnotes this phrase, he was made to be a sin offering on our behalf. The complete Jewish Bible, picking up the Jewish flavor of that, renders it the same way. That him who knew no sin was made to be a sin offering on our behalf, which would be consistent with the purity of Jesus on the cross to take away our sins and would be consistent with the way sacrifices are discussed in the Old Testament, which foreshadow and anticipate what Jesus would do on the cross. But God justified us without becoming unjust himself. Let's take a little aside again. You know, the atonement is described in a lot of different ways. The atoning sacrifice of Jesus, the propitiation to take away our sins, is described many different ways in the New Testament. So consider the following atonement illustrations, and I'm sure this is not exhaustive. But if you talk about what Jesus did on the cross from the standpoint of the fact that we are guilty in, in the court of God, Jesus, through his crucifixion, provided justification. 
we are now forgiven and thus not guilty. Our past has been removed. In regard to relationships, we are alienated from God. Sin separates us from God, Isaiah 59, but we are reconciled to God through the death of Jesus on the cross. From the standpoint of being alienated and being outsiders, we see that through the crucifixion of Jesus. We are now sons and daughters of God, and thus we are His family. If you look at sin as if it were a critical illness, which spiritually, sin leads to death. We see that Jesus provides healing. By the way, in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, some of the, the metaphors that are used to talk about the atonement have to do with critical illness and spiritual healing. When you talk about death, we're dead in sin. But through what Jesus did on the cross, we have new birth, regeneration, new creation. From the viewpoint of slavery, we sold ourselves into, into slavery to sin and Satan, but Jesus liberated us. He gave us freedom, and like the Israelites were redeemed and were freed from slavery in Egypt, we are freed from bondage and sin. Similar to that, commerce. Again, sin is a debt we cannot repay. But Jesus redeems us through his sacrifice on the cross. From the viewpoint of worship, we cannot approach God with acceptable worship, but Jesus became the sacrifice so we can present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him, which is our reasonable service. From the viewpoint of moral peril, we, we are in danger of eternal condemnation, of eternal, uh, being, eternally being lost, but Jesus rescues us. He saves us through His death upon the cross. And from the standpoint of war, the long war of God against Satan, we see that Jesus provides us with victory through his crucifixion on the cross. And you know, you think about this. Different people are in different situations in their lives. And thus, one of these illustrations will speak especially powerfully to one person, but a different illustration is especially helpful to somebody else. My wife's got cancer. She's been battling cancer for four years. Many of you have prayed for her, and many of you have asked about her this week, and, and we appreciate that so much. And let me tell you something. When you talk about spiritual healing that Jesus provides, when you have a critical uh, physical illness, it helps that illustration of atonement mean that much more. You think of the Israelites whose background was slavery in Egypt. You think that didn't speak powerfully to them when they think about what Jesus did on the cross? But the crucifixion shows us the following things. Please consider them with me. One of those is the awful nature of sin. You know, the truth is that sin is horrific in a way that you and I cannot put into words. We cannot fully describe that. All, all the atonement illustrations we gave just a moment ago are many different ways to try to paint the picture to show us just how serious is our situation without what God did for us on the cross. But think about this. Every sin is horrible. And when you see Jesus on the cross, remember that. Remember that. But then also remember this. We can't put into language how bad sin is. So God displayed his son on a cross to graphically show us how bad sin is. And we alluded to all those passages earlier. But we don't just see the horror of sin. My friends, we see the magnificent love of God in Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And let me hasten to say, the point of that verse is not to catalog everything that is involved in what we must do to receive the gift of God. The point of that verse is to say, look what God did. loves us like that. 
And he wants us to love him in return. And he wants us to love other lost sinners and help them see that only he is the way of redemption. But I want to conclude with this one. The crucifixion of Jesus shows our desperate need for transformation. You know, we're familiar with Romans chapter 6. We use that chapter a lot, and we should. A lot of people don't understand the, the necessity of water baptism for remission of sins, and Romans chapter 6 powerfully speaks to that. But that's not the primary point of Romans chapter 6. The primary point of Romans chapter 6 actually goes to the first two verses where he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? We've been baptized into Christ. So now that we are Christians, are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we, here we go, who died to sin still live in it? You see, the primary point of Romans chapter 6 is because we've been baptized into Christ, we should understand that just as Jesus died and was buried and rose to redeem us, we must die to the love and practice of sin, being buried in the watery grave of baptism and rising from that watery grave, not just forgiven, but to walk in newness of life need transformation. Romans 12 speaks very powerfully to that as well, where we see that we are to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, perfect, and acceptable. My friends, Jesus did not die on the cross to just forgive us that's it. Jesus died on the cross because we needed forgiveness so that we could also become more like the Son of God. Remember Romans chapter 8 that we read just a little while ago. Romans chapter 8 where Paul writes about what God has done in grand terms in providing us with this new hope and new opportunity. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become something. To become conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus died to remove our past and transform us in our present with the hope of eternal life when we quit the walks of this world. But you know, somebody declares, you know, God, God chose to use Christ on the cross as the means to redeem us, but God really could have saved us any way he wanted to. My friend, are you sure about that? Think about this. If there was some other way to redeem us from our sins beside the Son of God going through what He went through on the cross, would not God who loves His Son have chosen another method? My friends, the reason Jesus went to the cross to redeem us is because there was no other way we could be redeemed. That's how bad sin is. That's how much God loves us. That's how much we need the hope that Jesus provides. God had to pay the ultimate cost for our sin to redeem us from that sin because we owed him a fathomless debt that we could never repay. But the precious blood of Christ could take away our sins. And he did exactly that to give us the hope that we can never have without him. Two thoughts in conclusion. Why the crucifixion? I may not know all the answers to that question, but I'll tell you two things. It shows the depth of our brokenness and sin. And Christ on the cross shows us the amazing love of God to redeem us. And may we all, 
like Paul, say that as we live in this world, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain because Christ died for us to redeem us. And may we serve him in faithfulness all the days that we have. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Shane, for bringing us to the foot of the cross again. We need to live there. Some of you know that I have been involved in the Philippine work for about 30 years. I try not to be obsessed with that. There's a lot of other things that pertain to our life as Christians. But I'm reminded by this sermon of Paul making those appeals during the time that the Jews were suffering such terrible poverty. We don't know all the reasons for that. But in God's providence, there were Gentile churches that were able to relieve much of that suffering. And when Paul discusses that in 2 Corinthians 8, he made the very appeal that we've heard tonight in reference to Christ who was willing to come and make himself poor so that we could be rich. I mention it for this reason, very brief point, but I wanted to mention this. I felt compelled to do it. Between October of 2019 and May of 2020, there were 16 successive earthquakes in the same part of southern Mindanao with over 4,000 aftershocks. Now, this is a region where the gospel has been spreading for years. And some of the brethren who have been most notable in that work don't even know how far it spreads. They can't keep up with it because people learn the truth and then Muslim rebels or communist rebels go through and burn their village and that scatters them and the gospel just scatters again. A hundreds of our brethren lost their homes during that period that I mentioned. And for these three years, we've been working to raise funds to build small houses. It cost about $600 when we started doing that. The inflation has driven that number to about $1,000 to make a very small house for these brethren. I'm going to spend my next trip in August going to that region just to get eyes on what's being done. But for reasons we don't understand, just like when I referred to what happened back in the first century. They live in a land of deep poverty. And if it's not an earthquake, it's a rat invasion or something else. How do you explain that while we live in a land of such prosperity? I don't know. Except that I know God is trying to teach us something about living at the foot of the cross. And I'm conscious I haven't done enough to learn that lesson. And there may be people here tonight that could help as we're trying to get these Christians. I can't really understand it, even though I'm reporting it to you. Families that have been living in tents for three years in the Philippine Islands, not in a state park, where they have torrential rains and it turns their area into a mud pool. Some of the tents are shredded now. And so pray for these brethren. And if you're able to help, we'll be happy to help you relay funds to that place. Thank you for giving me this time to say that. I'll be accompanying Ron in August on his trip to the Philippines and look forward to working together in Mindanao. Thank you, Shane. I believe that Jesus died for my sins is a statement that all faithful Christians and all believers can affirm. This is my hope and this is my plea. You know, sometimes it's been jokingly said 
about preachers that if they know that their point is weak, the solution is, you know, raise your voice and pound on the pulpit. And Shane didn't have to raise his voice tonight, did he? And he taught deliberately, and he taught calmly, and he taught quietly at times, but powerfully, because he's preaching biblical truth and the greatest story ever told. If you have people back home that you think could benefit from this lesson or others, uh, I recommend that you uh, not only think in terms of bringing one of these excellent uh, lecture books home yourself for your own personal future study, but share them with brethren at home or your family. I usually always buy a box and bring it back to Alvin and distribute it among the saints, my fellow elders and fellow deacons, that, uh, fellow elders and the deacons that serve, and my children. I want them to have copies of such good and rich material as a resource for future years. So uh, you can get a box of 14, talk to Joanna or, or Lance, and, and that's how they come, and, and that would be a very easy thing to ship if you need to do it that way. A little bit of business, uh, and then Lance and I both are going to speak uh, about the uh, truth publications, and he has some things to follow up on his comments from last night, but I wanted to just share with you about the challenges that we faced here at Truth Publications over the last pandemic, the economic uh, crisis that we're presently in, and the supply issues that are affecting uh, probably every industry in the country, but affecting us as well. I wanted to start by saying the board appreciates so much uh, how that everyone connected with this organization uh, Lance and his staff at CEI in particular have pulled together and have helped us streamline operations and improve our efficiencies and meet the needs of our customers and our brethren. And on our website, truthbooks.com, prominently displayed, is this saying, which summarizes what we're about. You and your church need trustworthy books and resources. We publish and provide Bible-based products to help everyone grow spiritually. That's what we are about. And so to achieve this end, we, we've got to operate from a sound financial footing and adjust to the changing economic conditions and adapt to new technologies as they come along. One of the things we've done as an organization is shift to print on demand as a way of producing our workbooks and, and commentaries and lecture books. And basically that means instead of printing a thousand copies of each volume and then having to warehouse them, we print more limited quantities and then reorder as needed. These kind of changes that have been sweeping across the industry have also affected Truth Magazine, which is my personal responsibility. And except for just a few national publications that mostly are supported by advertising, most religious and academic and professional journals have gone digital. And throughout 2022, this year has been especially difficult for us as an organization to meet the production schedule of the print version of the magazine. We've experienced difficulties and delays in getting it printed and then getting it distributed to the U.S. Postal Service. And supply chain issues that you've heard about in other contexts have affected us, where the printer had to stop because he either didn't have paper or ink or parts, and so we're at the mercy of a system that has broken and the staggering costs that keep going up on print matters uh, affect us as well. And so as a result, the executive committee of which I am a part have recommended to the board that we shift Truth Publications from a, or Truth Magazine, magazine from a print plus digital distribution to a distribution that focuses solely on digital distribution of our product. We've been developing this channel for a number of years and have been trying to master these different formats in which the magazine can be distributed and read in a variety of digital platforms. We've been trying to increase the quality of that product and the breadth of our offerings. And so Truth Magazine is available on Kindle, uh, on the, the Amazon Kindle platform, and people all over the world in any corner of the world can order it through Amazon and have it on their Kindles at the first of each month. We distribute it in a color PDF format that's accessible on any digital platform and often flows, uh, depending on your browser, uh, it, on the screen, easily read. We distribute it in a browser uh, format, which means that brethren, that brethren in the third world who uh, don't have the broadband access that we enjoy and take for granted can see it on their phones without it 
zapping all of their, their basic, you know, their, their uh, uh, usage for the month. And so it's been much more accessible with these changes. And most lately, we've been trying to develop our EPUB version that to me is the best and most promising of all these options. Uh, and, and I find it the most useful. And I'm going to try to help brethren understand the value of that. But we've been trying to broaden our product to meet this changing demand and increase the scope and the quality of our offerings. We regret this change. And it's, it's something that, as editor, I just say, OK, you know, it's just, reality is what it is. But we can't avoid it in the present economic climate. And so what we want to know, what we want you as our subscribers and customers to know is that we're going to do right by each of you. And hopefully, most of our subscribers will be able to make the transition to fully digital subscriptions. But since brethren subscribe throughout the year, and the length of your subscription uh, may have just started or maybe halfway through, we're going to, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, address the needs of each subscriber and make sure that you are taken care of. Really, the majority of our subscribers already receive Truth Magazine in digital format. That, that's become the most popular means of distribution when you add together all the varieties. And, and so while this comes at a cost, it also comes at, at a benefit or potential advantage. We can expand our offering. We can in, increase the number of columns that we regularly produce and reach a, a broader audience. I envision a youth column written by young people to young Christians. And, other ways as well in which we can provide sound scriptural teaching on relevant topics. You'll notice on our website there's something that's said uh, on our website at the, the masthead of the magazine. Under the title Truth Magazine it says, taking his hand, ta helping each other home. That describes in a brief and concise, concise way what we're about. Taking his hand means the authority of Jesus Christ and God the Father are paramount. That is the most important thing. We must take his hand, and he leads, and we follow. And then, having done that, we can help each other. Our brethren, those outside of the body of Christ, but our brothers in humanity who need Christ, we can help them, and we can help ourselves by applying God's word to our physical homes and making our family stronger, by applying God's word to our spiritual homes, the church, through faithful proclamation of the gospel, and by submitting to the will of God, and, and by enjoying the forgiveness made possible through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who died for my sins and yours, we can reach our heavenly home. That's what we're about. And so we ask your prayers toward that end. That's not my step stool. I, it was too easy. I had to. Right, Bruce? That, that was too easy. I, first of all, if I can have a moment, I want to commend Mark for the tireless work that he does uh, for the organization and especially Truth Magazine. Um, very few people probably realize, I know Mike Willis realizes what it takes, but very few people probably realize what it takes to do uh, what this man does to produce that. Whether it's in digital format or print, that's uh, really irrelevant uh, when it comes to the actual work that is done uh, behind the scenes by Mark to make it happen. Um, and so my hat is off to him. And it's not just him, but the writers and such that are involved. I will ask on a, a business note, uh, for some of your patience with this transition because this will take some effort uh, as Mark said to make sure that all subscriptions are honored and taken care of in the right ways uh, but we will be committed to that uh, but that'll be a learning curve and a little bit of a challenge for all of us and as he said a case-by-case -case basis and I would also ask for that same kind of patience as we are navigating some very new waters uh, in the current economic times supply chain issues uh, print on demand now becoming the very high majority of our business. Uh, if you really don't understand the impact of that, I would love for you to come visit me at the bookstore and I'll walk you through the warehouse and I can show you uh, what has changed in the last five to seven years in particular uh, inside of our operation. 
And some of the things that come with that are challenges for our staff because uh, just-in-time inventory is a challenge. Uh, but financially, it's the right thing for us to do. And so sometimes that does mean that we're out of a book for a couple of weeks or things like that, more so than we want to be. I assure you of that. But it's for good reasons, and it's for sound reasons. And so I hope you'll understand that and work with us as we try to get better and better at, at what we do in that regard. Now, in regard to just-in-time inventory, hey, we got more of these today. <laughs> so uh, thankfully, if you are, are after the Psalter, worshiping, worshiping with the Psalms, uh, there are uh, a select few in the back, so I would hurry back there. Uh, and while the, the supply lasts that we got today, we'll be glad to put one in your hands tonight. And then last thing that I wanted to do, my step stool, drawing, $100.00 free shopping at CEI Bookstore. Y'all ready for this? Y'all, that's why y'all really stayed tonight, right? Martin Bragwell. Well, how about that? Good, and we got the winner here tonight. You can see me as we end tonight. All right, now, Thursday night, we're going to draw for $250. So again, go by the bookstore, show them your badge that you've been to Truth Lectures and enter uh, for that special drawing. We really appreciate your attendance and being a part of it. You're so supportive and so kind. Uh, and if you get a chance, really tell the, the bookstore staff thank you because I'm a slave driver, they'll tell you, and uh, this is a tough week. So uh, give them all the grace that you can. They're doing a great job uh, helping us out here. Uh, Steve Wolfgang is going to come and close us uh, in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed for the night. We'll see you bright and early, right? 8 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, for our first session here. Oh, yeah. A reminder of the open forum tomorrow afternoon. That's a special session, 2 o'clock. Uh, so we'll try to get you out of here as quick as we can there at the end so you can grab lunch and, and get back here for the 2 o'clock open forum. Let us reverently stand before our Maker. O Lord, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. We come into your presence tonight, Lord, boldly because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we come in an attitude of penitence and of praise and of petition. Of penitence because we, we know, Lord, that you are a holy God, that you cannot abide sin, that for all who come before you, you must be regarded as holy. And so we come begging pardon, asking forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ for sins that we have committed, and acknowledge, Lord, that like Daniel of old, we have disregarded, disrespected, disobeyed your will too often. And we ask not only your forgiveness, but your strength that we might ever do your will. And Lord, we come in an attitude of praise because of who you are and what you have done for us. We praise you for all that we see in the natural world and the creation and all of the blessings that, we, uh, that, that you bestow upon us through, these nat through food and shelter and all of the things that are blessings to us. And as our brother Ron has reminded us that are often not distributed equally throughout the world, we pray that we may have compassion upon those who do not have. But Lord, we praise you also because of the physical gift of, of music and song, that we can praise you in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in our hearts, making melody in our hearts, again, because of the sacrifice and the triumph of Jesus Christ. We are grateful, Father, and praise you for the revelation through your word, through the scriptures. And we thank you for our brothers and sisters who have come this week to call our attention to your revelation in the Bible and particularly to the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, and the call to believe in him and all that he did and all that, that he has done for us. But above all, Father, we are thankful for that sacrifice, for the word himself. And we pray, Father, that you will help us ever to grow closer to him. And we come to you, Father, in an attitude of petition. We all have petitions we know of individuals who are suffering and grieving even at this very hour, who are on beds of affliction, who are ill and in need of medical attention, and we pray that your 
that your hand and your guidance would be upon them. For those from whom we may be separated for these few days, we would ask a measure of comfort and security that you might be with them. And we pray, Father, above all, that at the end of life that you'll bring us together on the other side. For we make the prayer in the name of your Son.